Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is fiction writer Kai Emmons, author of the novels His Mother's Son, The Stylist, and most recently, Weather Woman. Prior to writing fiction, Emmons was a dramatist. Her early plays Murgatroyd and what, When Petulia Comes were staged in New York. While in New York, she wrote, directed, and edited independent and industrial films. After moving to Los Angeles, Emmons wrote feature-length screenplays and several teleplays. Emmons earned an MFA in film from uh, New York University and an MFA in fiction from the University of Oregon's creative writing program. She teaches fiction and screenwriting at U of O. Welcome, Kai. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, tell us a bit about your background and how you <clears throat> aim to be all these different kinds of writers that you are. Okay. Well, you know, I think that um, my first love has always been fiction, but I didn't identify it early on because I wasn't sure how one would make a living in fiction. Mm. Um, in college, I wrote plays, and I began to actually have them done, but there was a similar problem. How do you make a living as a playwright? Especially, I was writing surreal plays that weren't about to be on Broadway. So. <laughs> Um, so I thought, well, I had an interest in film, and I knew one could make a living in film. So I pursued it a little and then liked it enough so that I, I went to film school. And um, that kind of launched me, not immediately into a writing career, but into a career making films and, you know, for editing them and, you know, writing on the side, of course, and then eventually writing screenplays. And ultimately, I kind of felt that screenwriting and film in general was not my medium because it doesn't permit for interiority mm -hmm. which had always entranced me about fiction so you know I had a good run there I learned a lot about how to structure a piece of writing um, I had a lot of fun working in film it's very collaborative and um, but eventually I sort of made my way to fiction and that feels like my proper home <laughs> my proper genre <laughs> <laughs> um, so <coughs> your website uh, says that you are weather and climate obsessed. Why is that? Well, <laughs> that is true. I'm very <laughs> obsessed with weather. And more recently, climate, of course. Um, I grew up in New England, and uh, the weather in New England is notoriously changeable and often quite severe. And we would have hurricanes, and we'd go up to the attic of our house and watch the trees swaying back and forth, and it was kind of the best entertainment you could have. We also had blizzards, which I loved, of course, because not only were they fun to watch and it was sort of entrancing being inside the snow globe, but also because they kept us home from mm -hmm. school. Um, I remember my senior year in high school, we had a two-foot blizzard, had most of the week off from school, and then we had the regular vacation. And then we had another two-foot blizzard right after th after the, the next following week. So anyway, so I... I loved weather, and I think I even had that feeling of wanting to, I, I know I had that feeling of wanting to change the weather quite often. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in, at Halloween, it was often cold, and you had to wear a coat over your um, costume, which was no fun. Uh, I got married in the rain in late May, and that was something I would have wished differently. <laughs> um, so there were m multiple occasions, and I, so I think the character of Bronwyn was always waiting to be created. Um, and the reason I did it now was because of all the extreme weather we've been having for the last number of years, and it just seemed like the timing was right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Bronwyn Artair, who is yeah. the protagonist of the, the most recent novel, The Weather Woman. So you've given us this, uh, we, we now understand the genesis of this character. Right. Tell us a little bit about a rough sketch of the, the novel. What, okay. what happens in the novel? What's it um, about? Bronwyn is a character who at the start of the book has just turned 30. She, <clears throat> a year earlier, she dropped out of an atmospheric sciences program at MIT where she had a wonderful female mentor who's so, almost a surrogate mother. But she never felt she really fit in the world of academic science. Not that she's not brilliant, but she just didn't quite fit there. So she dropped out and took a job in uh, southern New Hampshire at a TV station where she is the local meteorologist. And it's not the ideal job because there are a lot of constraints. She's not allowed to talk about climate change. She's forced to sing on the air, sing weather songs. Um, and as she's kind of adjusting to this, a year in, her boyfriend her, of a number of years dumps her. And so she finds herself at a very low point in her life. 
And this being at this low point sort of allows something to bloom in her that has always been dormant, which is this high level of attunement with the natural, with the natural world. And she discovers not only is she attuned, but she can also change it. So that's sort of the, the, the where we begin the book, mm -hmm. and it goes from there. And of course, one of the important things is her coming to accept that she really can do this, because that's not immediate. I mean, who of us would think that if the clouds disappeared that we had done it? Um, but she does come to accept it, and then she has to figure out who she's going to tell and what she's going to do with it, and that, and that is really becomes an obsession throughout the book. Mm -hmm. So um, the book begins with an epigraph from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Yes. Can you tell us why you chose that epigraph? Yes. The original, I'm reading you from the arc that has three epigraphs, ah. but I narrowed it down to one because. <laughs> okay. Um, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So why was that an important demograph for you? I think it speaks to the fact that while no one at this current po moment in time can change the weather as far as we know, um, that there, are, there may be such capabilities down the line. We under, I mean, it, and in any human endeavor, whether it's moving, speaking, thinking, there is some sort of energy exchange that goes on with the world. And it is possible, I'm not saying it's possible in the near future, but it is possible that that energy could be corralled and used to alter the weather. Um, uh, there's a quote that is attributed to Richard Feynman, the, the late physicist, um, which is that if you, in a, a cubic foot of air holds all the energy necessary to boil all the oceans in the world. Now, it turns out, after I consulted with a physicist <laughs> friend of mine, that that's not exactly true, but it's close to true. It's still a very limited um, amount of space. Yeah. So you, you've begun to get to my next question, which is, the book has been called um, a work of magical realism, and, I, and I, you just told me that it's also been called a, a, a work of low fantasy, which yeah, That's sure. a very recent term. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I like that one, but yeah. the idea of combining the realism and, and a fantasy or s the supernatural, why did that make sense to you as the way to structure this book? Okay, um, one thing, when I am describing the book, I say, I say that I'm, uh, this is a realistic novel with one fantastical element, mm -hmm. which is, uh, on some level it's minor, of course, on some level it makes possible the rest. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the fantasy aspect that I wanted to explore so much as what that does for Bronwyn herself, mm -hmm. what it does for her relations with the world, what it does for her sense of what she might do to affect climate change, uh, those things. Um, so it becomes, <laughs> my, my brother-in-law was reading the book and he got stuck in the initial point where she begins to do some alteration. And she was talk he was talking to her daughter, I mean, sorry, his daughter, and she's a poet, and she said, it's a device, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was great, because it is a device. It's an a it, it opens up an avenue to looking at other things, mm -hmm. and yet it doesn't, it's not like creating an entire world of fantasy, mm -hmm. where everybody is doing aberrational things. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, I th I've thought a lot about uh, the book by Na Naomi Alderman called The Power, mm -hmm. in which, um, young girls, adolescents, develop, have this ability to a greater or lesser degree to <laughs> do this thing that sends a spark out into the world that is uh, quite dangerous, actually, and can really damage people and kill people, and pr men in particular. And it's, um, it, it goes across all the women, mm -hmm. or all the young girls, and, um, and in that sense that's a more of a sociological novel mm -hmm, almost mm -hmm. whereas this is more of a psychological novel mm -hmm. in that Bronwyn is the only one that can do it, this as far as we know and um, she is trying to figure out how to negotiate that. Mm -hmm. you know. So, so you've just described it in very interesting terms. Would you mind reading us a passage at this point certainly. to give us a sense of the style and yes. the way that you're accomplishing this aim that you've yes. just described? I'm um, going to read a section. Um, Bronwyn has gone, shall, can I set yeah, it up? Sure, yeah, sure, Bronwyn has gone to Tornado Alley where there is a man that she 
there who is also a TV meteorologist who she doesn't know, but she's kind of taken, she's been watching for years and she's kind of taken him on as a mentor. Mm -hmm. So she has made an appointment to see him and feels as if he's, he's one who um, appears to be able to predict the pathway of tornadoes and he saved many lives and he, she's sure they have a real connection. As it turns out, when she meets him, he's kind of an asshole. <laughs> um, and he's very uh, diminishing of her and doesn't believe her. But in the meeting with him, she's met this, this guy um, who is um, a pastor, a sort of strange pastor, but somebody who she ultimately is very simpatico with. And his name is Earl. So they've just finished having coffee. They get back in the car. Bronwyn can't relax. The clouds are long arms striating the sky, churning and bilious, black beneath and flocked with icy white on top. The fields that yesterday looked golden are now a dull brown. Earl lives a few miles away. He's invited her to his house before they head back to Oklahoma City. She should have brought her rental car to save him all this driving. There's a feeling haunting her all the time now that sh she should be elsewhere doing something other than what she is presently doing. But she can never identify what that other thing is. Don't you feel lonely here, she asks? So few houses and people and all this sky and grassland? Lonely is an inside thing, he says, a state of mind. You think there aren't lonely people in New York City? Thousands, believe you me. He turns from the wheel. You are either a very young soul or a very old one. I can't tell which. Earl's way of seeing is bleeding into her a little. She's acutely aware of her own porousness. Something is fomenting, the day hankering for a fight, not just with anyone, but with her specifically, vengefully, as if w Vince's will is behind it. Lightning streaks down from aloft, a thin zipper. Thunder snaps, then morphs to a long, low groaning. Earl echoes the groan. Bronwyn drifts. Her skin begins to hum. Her vessels dilate. The heat coalesces and slides through her blood. Her gaze ticks over the cloud directly in front of them, a classic wall cloud. The sky's hemorrhage. Hail pounds the windshield. Ahead of them, a tornado swaggers into view, shimmering like a hologram, snaking east, an animated column, skinny at its base, splayed wider at its top, its edges indistinct but still a discreet thing. It twists and bends like a human with a waist, supple as a hula hooper, mocking in its gyrations, prowling laterally across the sky. As they watch, it swerves, reverses directions, advances straight toward them as if the two of them are its intended prey. She thinks of Vince. Earl pulls to the side of the road, shuts off the ignition. He bows his head. Blessed Father, hold us safe. Bronwyn tumbles from the car into a granular rain and steadies herself on the road's shoulder. The funnel is closer now, and it swivels and taunts, advancing quickly one moment, then taking its time, continuously spewing digested debris. She stares it down as the heat rises to her head, and sounds of the ordinary world, the battering rain, Earl's muttered prayers, slide away. She ascends into the spinning wind, the whizzing electrons, the immense charge, meeting it all with her own immense charge. Then begins the rhythmic hurling, her brain seethes and pops, and she falls into blackness. It's a wonderful passage, and there are a, a number of passages that are, resemble that one in, in this very realistic description of this miraculous energy that she harnesses from within and projects out into the climate, out into the world. Um, the book has also been called an eco-feminist allegory, and there are times in the novel, so she stops a hurricane here, she'll go to California and she'll um, confront a gigantic wildfire, which she will also use her power to stop. Um, Talk about the themes of female agency and power in this book. I mean, it's, 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 it's obviously, a, she has this literal power, but it's yes. also very much about the power of women and the right. agency of women. 
It is, ultimately it is, for, that is the most, um, kind of the biggest arc in the story, is her, the story of her empowerment. And of course I've explained how we, she begins at a very low point in her life. And she's a per, one of these people who, despite her brilliance, has never really felt she had a place in the world. And uh, she wouldn't have any place in the world were it not for her, her mentor, Diane. Um, and I think by the end, she's well aware of her power. And so she is confronted with the next question about what it means to have power. Um, you know, how do you use it and how do you prevent power from becoming damaging? And, um, well, I will say, you know, I don't think how one uh, prevents it from becoming damaging is ever answered by the book. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she doesn't answer it for herself mm -hmm. and kind of goes into hibernation after the book ends. There is a sequel uh -huh. in which she, be uh, she begins in hibernation and is drawn mm. out for various reasons. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I, I felt I had to write that because I, I was, well, for one thing, I was very interested in the relationship with, between Diane and Bronwyn, and let me address that in a second. But also, I felt that there was something inconclusive in just leaving them there mm -hmm. in, I hope it's not giving anything away to say the book ends in Siberia, mm -hmm. on the methane fields, the melting permafrost um, is what she's trying to address. But um, there was also the, un I mean, while we're talking about female power, Diane is a person who understands her power has used it, has negotiated the tricky world of, of um, men in academic science very well, mm -hmm. and she's found a place for herself and she's not afraid. Bronwyn begins as very afraid, and so she ha she's learned a lot from Diane, but then there is this point where there has to be a rift, um, and I think you know, they come together at the end, but th th there's, um, that was also something I was interested in exploring in terms of, you know, what that, <laughs> what that means in terms of female power, I guess, mm -hmm. or, or the different ways that, I mean. It's interested in this yeah. relationship between the two, and, and I mean, it isn't but, just about Bronwyn learning about her power, it's also Diane learning to accept. Bronwyn's power, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. and, and there are different kinds of power. I guess that's what I'm getting at is that, um, they, they both possess power, they both have different kinds of power, and they both need to respect each other's. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and that is a big arc in the book, um, I so, think, as well. So, you know, what, reading this book in, tw you know, in our moment. Yes. In the moment mind. of blockbuster superhero films. Yes. And, you know, the question naturally arises, do you think of Brahman as a superhero? <laughs> is she a kind of superhero? Well, I've thought a lot about this. <laughs> and I realized, you know, the, the sort of archetypal superhero hero story involves a kind of gigantic confrontation, usually with good versus evil. Mm -hmm. And it felt to me very reductive to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I felt it would um, obliterate some of the psychological nuances, some of the relationship nuances. So I elected very early on not to go in that direction, mm -hmm. although <laughs> I should have brought, I have some superpower fortune cookies that I made <laughs> for readings, and each one has in it a, 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 so I'm aware of the superpower aspect of it, mm -hmm. more the superpower than the superhero, mm -hmm. if, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. you know? Interesting. Yeah. So another way of thinking about the book, which it's already becoming clear, is that it's a work of uh, climate fiction, or what they now yeah. call cli-fi. Cli -fi. Right. Um, so tell us how you understand the role of literature in raising awareness about climate change. Why is that a useful genre, a useful way of making people think right. about that problem? Well, I think one thing about, about fiction as instructive in any way is that it's unthreatening. So that people can um, move into fiction without feeling like they're being forced to take a position on something or confront somebody else's position on something. And I, I think good novelists don't present a novel in term in any polemical way mm -hmm. that you know I'm not trying to tell you you need to get out there and do something or that this is happening if you don't believe it but um, I think it does it mainly becomes a, a way of raising questions what do we do what you know for example the white fox at the end of the book I don't mm -hmm. know again if I'm um, this is a spoiler but 
there Bronwyn is out trying to do this individualistic thing, and the white fox is saying, where are your people? You, you've got to, you know, you've got to find a tribe to do this with. Um, yes, very, very interesting. Um, I, I, I'm an English prof, so I have a sort of yeah. English prof kind of question. Yes. Um, the novel is written largely in the in the present tense, which is not the most common way that right. novels are written. Right. Why did you choose to write it in the present tense? I think um, really this is a often, I, I know many writers who feel this way, it's a strategy for really immersing oneself in the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, it really is, can be substituted for past tense very easily. Mm -hmm. But in the writing of it, it brings you into the immediacy of the moment. And so that's why I elected to do it. And I, it wasn't like I was ever going to transcribe it into the past after that. But mm -hmm. because, as, uh, I mean, the other thing is, um, you know, as the past asks for a certain kind of reflection on the moments that are happening, you, there, there's that distance between the narrating moment and the uh, event, moment of the events mm -hmm. uh, transpiring. And I kind of wanted that to be. You know, this is something new. This is something we haven't seen before, you know. Yes, very so, interesting. Yeah. I should also say, I mean, for the reader, I think it creates yeah. a greater sense of immediacy as well. Right, right. I think, and, you know, a lot, um, well, I've, I've, my first, no actually, I think all my novels have been written in the present tense. <laughs> it's not intentional. It's just something that I guess is maybe a writing take at this point. Hmm. My current novel is not. Hmm, interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. So um, one of the other things that's already been, you've already made clear is yeah. that this project entailed a lot of research. Oh, yes. Would you I'm tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, as soon as I decided that she was going to be a meteorologist and an atmos a former atmospheric scientist, I realized, gosh, I mean, pff, I need to do a lot of reading. So I began with great courses where there was a wonderful um, 24 lecture series called Meteorology and in 101, an introduction to the wonders of the weather, something like that, taught by a um, UCLA professor, Robert Fovell, and it was it was terrific. It was not really elementary. On I mean, I don't have a huge background in mm -hmm. science, so I found it pretty challenging, mm -hmm. even though it was 101. <laughs> but it set out all the parameters of what I needed to know, and I found it extremely useful. And so then I went on to I read some neuroscience because you know what she's doing is a thing in her brain, and then physics. Um, all of which I understood some of. <laughs> um, and then I went on to uh, climate change books. Uh, I don't know, the Humanity Center had this wonderful guy, Craig Childs, mm -hmm. Apocalyptic Planet. Mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite books. Yep. Um, of course, Elizabeth Colbert's work and Bill McKibben. And, um, and let's see, what else? Oh, there's a wonderful book that maybe was my first book in terms of thinking about doing this, which was, is called The Intention Experiment, hmm. and it's by Lynn McTaggart, and she reviews all the literature. Do you remember a book called The Secret Life of Plants? Oh, sure. Okay, well, it begins with that research, and it looks into a lot of it, the research that is based on entanglement theory, mm -hmm. which for anybody who's watching this who doesn't know the basics of that, I can't say I understand it deeply, but when two particles have interacted in any way, Thereafter, they always retain, they b behave in response to one another. And, and this is something that Einstein observed many years ago and didn't quite believe, believe it, called it spooky action at a distance. Um, but when those particles are removed, they're still reacting in relationship to one another. So at any rate, this book kind of reviews a lot of the research that has done with that in, in mind. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And tell us about the, the uh, scientists who you accompanied uh, to, <laughs> to Greenland. Yeah. This was a, a, a real experience for me because it was the first time I'd ever actually met someone on Twitter. I mean, mm -hmm. met it to the point where he said, why don't you, all right, this was, his name is Jason Box, and I found him because he was doing research in Greenland on the, uh, he called it the Dark Snow Project. Mm -hmm. And dark snow is the snow that has been become darkened by soot um, from wildfires and other things that has blown over from mostly North America mm -hmm. and landed on Greenland, darkening the snow and therefore accelerating absorption of heat and accelerating um, melting. Mm -hmm. um, so he was studying that and he said, I'm going, going to Greenland, on, I'm going to be the resident scientist on this trip, why don't you come along? Well, an invitation was like, <laughs> that, like that, I couldn't refuse. So we went up the west coast of Greenland, we stopped at all these little towns along the way on these rocky 
um, cli cliffs, their little uh, brightly co colored houses perched there. Mm. We got off, we kayaked among the icebergs. We, at one point, he brought us a million year old ice core oh, wow. that he made into gin and tonics. So we're. <laughs> 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 um, so at any rate, it was really eye-opening, and we have since become friends. And yeah, ah, very yeah. cool, very cool. Um, so, tell us a little bit about your writing process. How do you, what do you do? What kind of what do we do? Yeah. Um, in terms of daily writing process, yeah. or just a, yeah, well, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing, but um, we have a coffee maker in our bedroom. Mm -hmm. The coffee goes off, it is, you know, it's set automatically, and um, my partner Paul brings it to me, brings me my coffee in bed, and I prop myself up, and I, he leaves, and I start working right there. And I write longhand on a, um, a, a lined pad of paper, and I, of course, then later have to type it all in, but um, I, I, it just sort of more matches my way of thinking um, hmm. better than, um, so that's, and I try to write for as long as I can until the day intrudes. Um, there, well, there are two things that intrude. One is a, a little bit of a need to get up and move, so I try to get up and walk around the house and do a few yoga stretches or whatever, but um, then return to work. But then, of course, there's either teaching mm -hmm. or, well, whatever life, you know. But I do not check my email I, early in the morning. I do not answer the door. I uh, don't answer the phone, all those things I kind of <laughs> leave. Good for you. Yeah. Momentum is a crucial yeah, it in is writing crucial. process. Yeah. So we just have about a minute left. Okay. Um, can you tell us what you're working on now? Yes, I'm working on a, a novel that is tentatively titled Hellion. And um, it involves, it's the f if it remains as it is now, it's the first first person novel I've written. Hmm. Um, and there are three interlinking stories that are very challenging to, to weave together. And so, um, like every novel I've written, I'm finding it has new challenges, different challenges, and I'm pretty immersed. Well, you know. we will look forward to uh, the uh, arrival of that next yeah. project. And I also, eagerness. there is uh, the sequel to, um, the sequel to Weather Woman, which is Sinking Islands, and I have a collection of short stories coming out next year called Vanishing. So that's oh, which are super productive. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Kai, Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I've been speaking with fiction writer Kai Emmons, author of the novels His Mother's Son, The Stylist, and most recently, Weather Woman. Thanks for watching. <laughs>